Okay. Um, so I don't know if you're aware, you most likely are because you can read, um, but Docker just released uh, Docker 1.13. Uh, I guess it was really just uh, a couple weeks ago or so. Uh, and they kind of contacted all the, the meetup organizers and asked us to do a quick little spiel on it, uh, you know, just, just shortly after release. So I'm going to run through their deck uh, and, and give you some of the highlights of Docker 1.13. Uh, like, full disclosure here, I actually haven't touched 1.13 yet. Um, I know some of the stuff, uh, a little bit about some of the stuff, but uh, I don't have all the details on, on all the things. But uh, let's take a look. So uh, kind of one of the, the first things they did was to totally restructure their command line interface. It's the, you know, the, the Docker CLI that if you've worked with it from the terminal, you're using it day in, day out, all the time for everything. And, you know, they've added so many kind of resources to Docker. You know, it's managing so many kinds of different resources now that, you know, all the commands is getting pretty hairy in there. And it's hard to understand what verbs operate on what nouns and such. So they, they kind of did that thing. It's, and it's, it's pretty standard these days. They restructured it so that there's subcommands. So now you've got, you know, your, the Docker, the Docker command, and then your resource that you're operating on, such as images, um, or, you know, containers or, uh, volumes, networks, and then your verb. Uh, what you're actually going to do with that particular resource. So they, they totally restructured it, uh, except for like just uh, a few, I think there's like five or six that they actually kept the same, um, totally the same, because they're just like so incredibly common and it would just kind of make no sense to actually completely hide those away underneath one of these subcommands. <clears throat> and, and you're able to actually, like in, in its, its current form in 1.13, you know, if you do a, a Docker help, you're going to see everything. But if you're you're ready to to take the jump and kind of forget about the way it used to be, the the old way, um, then you can actually set an environment variable and completely hide all that stuff. Like eventually, all that stuff will permanently go away. Right now, they're in kind of that deprecation mode where they've got a mix of both things going on, so they're not breaking everybody right out of the gate. Um, so so that's good and. You know, you can adopt it as you see fit. When you're firing up the Docker daemon, you're now able to supply the experimental parameter. And this, you know, as, as you can probably tell, enables the, uh, some of the experimental features of the Docker daemon. And what's more is it, you know, it interacts with the client. There's a, a round trip, an initial round trip that the client does when you're, you're doing commands to see if the uh, experimental flag is set in the daemon, if you, know, you can access those experimental features, and it makes those things available to you in the client as well. And yeah, it's just a matter of firing up the daemon with that flag set. And you know, one example uh, of an experimental feature in 113 is image squashing, which I'll kind of touch on uh, towards the end. This one is uh, really handy, uh, and it's actually something that, you know, when, when we were first developing Karina, our, our container solution on the Rackspace cloud, uh, something that we had to develop our own answer to, uh, we did, we created this thing called Docker Version Manager, because if you've ever tried to use the Docker client with uh, a newer version of the daemon, if your, your client major version didn't match that of the daemon on the server, you'd get an error back. Uh, I can't remember the, the specific, but it'd be like, you know, there was a miss, it was essentially a version mismatch. Uh, so we came out with this Docker version manager to, to handle that case and you could switch versions really easy, versions of the Docker client really easily. Um, but now they've baked that pretty much right into the Docker client, which is great. Um, Cause you know, it's, it's one less moving part, one less thing you have to kind of worry about. And 
what you're able to do now is effectively this. So, you know, before they had that compatibility, um, if you had uh, a, a newer client, it couldn't talk to one of the older daemon, daemons, right? One of the older uh, servers running uh, an older version of Docker. But now with 113, you're able to talk to an older daemon uh, without having to really do anything. Um, and, and it will do, again, there's a, a version negotiation it does uh, similar to uh, the round trip it does with the experimental flag to figure out which version is running on the client, which version is running on the server, and then you know adapting those calls so everything just continues to work. So that's that's really nice. That's a super super nice feature, especially for people who are using you know Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows, and you know you're you're on the on the up, upgrade treadmill on your local machine. You're always getting the latest. You're always getting the greatest. Uh, but of course, you know your your production servers almost certainly are not doing so. Uh, you know some some sanity uh, is required. So you're gonna upgrade to pro uh, your upgrade your production environments of course at a slower pace, and but you're still able to work with the latest and greatest on your local machines. Okay, so this one is for, so uh, I don't know if you know, but in, in the new Docker Swarm mode, uh, the, the key value store that they use to do service discovery is baked right into the daemon. And all the keys and certs and everything that does that that's, does the the TLS security and everything, those are are living on those hosts. Before in one twelve, none of that stuff, none of those keys, none of those certs were encrypted. But now with one thirteen, you're able to encrypt those things, uh, so they're they're encrypted at rest. And when you're doing you know the the TLS handshake and and all everything, of course it's encrypted then, and it's it's encrypted at rest as well. And you're able to to rotate your keys and and own those keys instead of having uh, the Docker client Docker daemon generate those things for you. You're able to supply your own and encrypt them. Uh, this is this is kind of a neat one, uh, and I, I love it when uh, basically any kind of uh, you know infrastructure software comes out with these sorts of plugins or, or software of any nature really and makes it really easy to create plugins uh, it really helps uh, build an ecosystem around you know whatever whatever piece of software it is you're working with uh, and they've made it considerably easier to do that uh, with docker now if maybe you remember or maybe you're here before I did uh, a whole presentation on creating a docker plugin before this stuff even existed, and and I tell you, it was a, a royal, not a royal pain, but it was a bit of a pain to develop. And you know, I didn't even try to distribute it. Um, you know, I just had it running on my local machine and everything. And I never, I have a, a Git rep repo for it, but I never actually like made it publicly available or anything. Um, and and it would have been non-trivial to do so. Uh, there would have been a lot of manual instructions you have to run through to do that sort of thing. But now with one thirteen, a plugin really just becomes kind of another resource to Docker, uh, and you're able to create them much more easily, enable them. Um, so this is, these are really like uh, kind of develop commands you'd use during the development of a plugin. For people who are just consuming plugins, uh, you're able to install them straight out of Docker Hub. So you know when when you don't have it prefixed with some sort of uh, URL here where your your registry is, where your uh, registry might be living. This is actually coming straight out of, of Docker Hub. And this one here, this SSHFS, is just an example plugin from one of the Docker developers, um, Victor. And I believe his name is Victor, Victor View. And um, yeah, it's, it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's SSHFS. It's a plugin that uses Fuse on the back end. So you're able to do uh, F SSHFS from your host uh, that's running the Docker plugin, you know, to some whatever machine it is that's actually running the SSH FS. And you're able to do things like supply, uh, you know, different environment variables for when you're, you're starting your, uh, so you, you would set these uh, environment variables and then you would start your plugin and it would start with those options enabled or, or what have you. 
And you know, hold on. Apologies. Yeah, I expect, um, Eric, would you mind maybe uh, taking a, a look at the front to see if somebody uh, tried to get in? Sorry, that's that's my phone number on uh, on that paper there, so I might just have a, a late arrival. Oh, and it's it's interesting to note um, that these plugins actually run as a container in Docker. Um, so, you know, very easy to run, very easy to isolate. You wouldn't actually see them when you do, you know, a, a Docker container list, uh, cause they're hidden from you. They don't want you, they don't want them always appearing in, in, as part of those containers, as your containers, you know, right? Cause it's really kind of something that's provided by the daemon or whatever. Um, but it is in fact running as a container. I thought, I thought that was interesting too. It, it makes just perfect sense, really. They've added a new resource, this uh, stack, as they call it, uh, and it's effectively, you know, being able to create an entire, you know, stack of resources, uh, you know, as you would with Docker Compose, and it's it's really using uh, a format similar to Docker, uh, you know, Compose that you used to working with, you know, version one or two, uh, but they've revved it to version three, yeah, new new version three Compose format. Uh, so now you're able to, you know, put together whole stacks and and create your services that way. And they've kind of swept out some of the stuff from from version two that was non-portable, like doing a build. You know, you, you'd only ever be building to one machine, so that really wasn't portable. You, you know, you're only ever building to one uh, host with v2. So they had to take that out of v3. Uh, and you know, likewise with volume from. Again, it's very uh, host specific, like you're only going to have that volume on one particular host. Uh, so that's not particularly portable. So they had to, to do away with some of that stuff, uh, in order to make compose and, you know, as they call it, the, the stacks now work as part of the Docker services, you know, running across many, many hosts. Uh, the question is, do I know where the V3 spec is? I expect in the, you know, docs. Dot, oh, you haven't found it. Okay. Two to three at the top line. Two to three at the top line, but there's no spec for it. I couldn't find I'm going to hunt down that answer for you. Um, and, and I'll try to respond to it in the, the comments of the meetup. Because I'm, I'm a, just a bit surprised by that, and that is, that should not be. Right, yeah, and I, you know, I've noticed they've they've put a, a considerable amount of uh, more effort into their docs, um, so that's you know even even more surprising. But well, well, their new commands are even though you know they're out, the main pages are still the old command. Oh, really? Yeah, it doesn't say list. Okay, I guess I guess they're lagging a bit there. Then yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, we can, we can chat about it. Maybe we can even have a, a look, uh, later on. Uh, what else is interesting about this? Oh, so one of the, so this, this actually replaces the, the Docker dash compose command line interface. If you've ever used that Docker dash compose, uh, that was a, a Python client. Uh, that's more or less, you know, not, not useful anymore. That's not going to work with the new V3, V3 format. Um, so I think, and, and one of the things that, that always kind of frustrated me about Docker compose, Docker dash compose being a separate command line client was that it never kept pace with what was actually going on in Docker. And it was always lagging, you know, something cool would come out that the engine was capable of, but you couldn't do anything with it in compose because it just hadn't been added to compose yet. But now it's all part and parcel in the Docker command line client. So it's going to be able to keep pace. Uh, I think a lot better from from here on out. Uh, this one's nice. Uh, <laughs> I've heard uh, Docker described as a, as a interface for filling up your hard drive, um, which it, it tends to do a pretty good job of uh, when you know you're grabbing images from all over the place and 
you know, um, people aren't taking care to, to use small base images and such, it can, it can fill up pretty quick. Uh, so there's uh, this, this system subcommand now uh, that lets you show disk usage, you know, DF, just, just like you would on any Linux system. Um, and, and you're able to prune, go ahead and prune anything that basically isn't being referenced by anything else. You know, so it's uh, garbage collection for Docker, essentially. Uh, and you're also, of course, able to, you know, be a little more specific if you just want to prune uh, a particular resource uh, from your from your environment. You're you're able to kind of target that as well. Uh, some other experimental features, uh, squash, uh, I alluded to before. So this takes a Docker image and and puts it all down into one single layer. Um, which is probably great for your production systems if you've got big images and you want to make them a little bit smaller or, you know, actually maybe a, a fair bit smaller, kind of depending. Uh, but maybe not so great for when you're doing development because if you're, you know, frequently pushing images to, uh, you know, your registry or, or, or wherever it is, if they're all squashed down into one, you, you can't do that nice diffing between layers, so you got to send the entire image, right, up to your registry. But if you're not squashing, you're, you're still, still able to just do that diff and only send the changed layers to the registry. Um, so squashing everything down to a single layer is probably the kind of thing you'd want to do on like images that are pretty well baked and, and aren't changing too frequently. Uh, Docker service logs. Um, this is a good one. Uh, it's, it actually kind of does what, uh, if back in 112, uh, if you were working with Compose and the new swarm mode services, you were able to see, and you did a Docker Compose logs, you're able to see all the logs, uh, of all your services running. Uh, that's effectively what this does now. So if you've got a service with a bunch of containers across a bunch of different hosts, it's going to aggregate all of those logs and give them to you in a nice stream. Uh, Docker init. This is one I'm less familiar with. Like I'm, I, I was aware that this is an issue. Um, and, and there was even one point where we, in one of the applications we were developing on Swarm, uh, we thought we had this problem but it turned out it was like a different problem. So I never really dug into uh, the whole issue of uh, having to kill a bunch of uh, zombie processes left around, um, but apparently Docker init does a good job of that. So if, if that's a problem, there's a you know, out of the box solution for that now, if that's a problem for you. Uh, handful of new flags, nothing, nothing terribly special here if you need to be attached to a specific network when you're doing a build. Um, and again, you know, uh, adding more flags, more features to the Docker services. So that's the, the Docker services you run when you're in swarm mode uh, now, or sometimes refer to a swarm kit, typically refer to a swarm mode. Uh, you know, you're able to do stuff that you were able to do with uh, containers before swarm mode. Oh, and, and a lot of these are for, uh, supporting Compose, that, that new Compose stuff in services, so for the stacks. Uh, this one's kind of nice too. Uh, these are actually two separate things here. Um, when you do like uh, an image pull and you're uh, on latest and you're running something, you know, you're running Redis latest on your, your swarm, it'll actually automatically under the hood pin it to a, you know, a, a particular digest of that image. Because you know, if you go and do a rolling upgrade across your service, it's gonna, you know, depending on what it is you're upgrading or whatever, you might not want to upgrade Redis to the latest, 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 latest. You, know, you might want it to be the latest at the time you ran it initially, right? Uh, it looks like I'm getting another call here, uh, Eric, if you don't mind. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so uh, you, you won't get kind of a nasty surprise in, in your production environments because, uh, you know, even though you're, you're running with Redis latest, uh, at least 
your you have uh, across your all of your your services across your swarm, you still have that. It's a consistent latest uh, for all of those instances of Redis or or what have you. Um, and then this one is you're you're able to specify and and. Uh, the example I saw was in one of the compose files, the new V3 compose files. You're able to uh, specify a, a failure threshold. So if you know you're rolling out a new version of your service, and you know over 10% of your containers are actually failing to start, then it'll just automatically roll back to the previous version. So just kind of handy um, as a, uh, a, a not a stopgap, but like just a What's a good term for it? Like a uh, fall fallback? Yeah, fallback is is probably the best term for it. Thank you. And more stuff around swarm mode. Uh, you can do high availability scheduling. Um, it's it's just better at spreading out tasks, which are uh, effectively containers uh, in swarm mode. Spreading out tasks across all your hosts in your swarm. Uh, and then some improvements to constraints around where tasks slash containers actually get scheduled to host in your swarm. Um, and, and better error messages. I love better error messages. This is a big thing for me. I love better error messages. Every system I develop, I'm always making sure it's producing good error messages. Um, <coughs> Global services should, should obey constraints. Global services are these things that uh, you specify that they they run across your entire, um, like on every single host in your swarm. Uh, those are uh, obeying constraints now. And if something no longer satisfies constraints, it gets kicked out of the swarm. So that's that's everything that's new in 1.13. Um, I don't want to kind of belabor it too much, but if you have questions, you know, I'll be around afterwards as well. Um, I, I think as probably everyone knows by now, or if not, now you do, uh, Docker column is coming to town uh, in April. So, you know, go ahead, get registered. Uh, if you want to join us there, you can get 10% off uh, using this code here, this promo code. Uh, this, the majority of this presentation and, and described in, in much greater detail, a full hour, uh, you can find in this blog post on, uh, Docker's blog. And I'll, I'll make, I'll, you know, provide a link to this presentation in the comments, you know, in a, in a day or two as well. And as Eric mentioned, <laughs> when we kick things off here, uh, Rackspace is actually hiring for Karina, uh, you know, our, our containers uh, as a service solution. Uh, and yeah, if you're interested, you know, come talk to me or, or just check out the, <clears throat> excuse me, job description and let me know, uh, if you're interested, we can have a, a quick chat and I can get you connected with the right people and you can join the, the team that I work on day in, day out. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Aquasec and our main presentation for the night on security. If you want to do a quick intro here. Thanks so much. Hi, uh, my name is Eric Gold. I'm from Aqua. I am not the person speaking tonight. I am the entertainment before the entertainment while he gets set up. Um, and I'm also going to introduce uh, Van to you. Van, uh, who's going to be speaking tonight, is a um, container security solution architect at Aqua. And he's been involved with most of our major customers, including um, Adobe, Autodesk, and um, Telstra in Australia, He's, he travels all over the world um, helping with container security. And uh, here in Austin, we actually have um, one customer who's using the, the technology that we'll be um, showing you as we talk about container security issues. Um, HomeAway is actually uh, using Aqua Security. And, um, and uh, uh, we actually have some other members of the team Dustin, if you can raise your hand. Dustin over there, he just spent the day at home away helping them. And then we've got Phil over here, and then me, Eric. And uh, we all love talking about um, Docker security, which is very bad for our wives and girlfriends. But for you guys, it means that if you want to have a conversation about Docker security, you can just grab any of us. So um, without further ado, here's Van, and he's going to tell you everything you wanted to know about Docker security issues. Thanks, man.
Thanks, Eric. So uh, before I even get started, I do have one announcement. Today is uh, Dustin's birthday, so everybody can say happy birthday to him. So he's so happy about coming out to this uh, Docker meetup event, and uh, he's going to spend the night with us. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so as uh, Eric mentioned, my name is uh, Chin Chang Van. I just go by Van. I'm, you know, sometimes I, I tell people I'm a Chinese-looking Dutchman. So, uh, and uh, my email handle is just right there, uh, van at aquasec.com. Uh, if uh, there are any questions uh, after the, the presentation, feel free to contact me. As uh, Eric was saying, you know, we we would more than happy to you know discuss any any uh, issues security related to uh, Docker. So let's get started. Um, first of all, uh, you know, the, the title itself actually kind of explained it uh, in the fact that do we need security for Docker? Okay. Okay, sorry. Uh, so the, the idea behind it is that uh, actually we are today talking about application security uh, with containerized applications, right? We're not really talking about Docker. Docker does a good job with it. You know, there are maybe a few references in general in terms of security issues with Docker, but by and large, I haven't seen anything major. So just to set the record straight, we're gonna be uh, talking about uh, uh, application security. So before we dive into that, what does Docker do? And here are probably areas you are familiar with. The first two, for example, that's really Docker's contribution. And that's what made it you know, so hot, that's used the word, for the past three years, okay? They came up with a standard image format. They, uh, they uh, came out with the, the container engine to make everything run nicely. And then obviously, uh, there are various uh, orchestration tools sitting on top of it. Um, you know, they are not necessarily contrib contributed by uh, Docker, but yet on the other hand, it provides a very rich ecosystem for us to, uh, to all work with. And uh, as we were saying, you know, Docker is able to secure the, uh, uh, the engine components, so we uh, basically don't have to worry about it. They also try to promote image accountability, and you know, the, uh, the Docker Hub itself, it's actually very useful. When I first got started with Docker, where did I go? Docker Hub, right? So everybody goes there and pull the images, but they also got a bum rep from that. If, you, uh, if you're familiar with it, uh, there are talk, uh, uh, you know, numbers out there saying over 30% of the images in Docker Hub are, you know, potentially problematic. We're talking about uh, high vulnerability. So we are going to uh, dive into that a little bit more. And then obviously, you know, we are all here trying to uh, promote the best practices using, uh, you know, the available tools. And so, so Docker, let's set the record straight again. It's a container platform and it's our responsibilities to really make sure the, uh, the security uh, you know, is in place, uh, uh, the security mechanism. So we are the ones who will then somehow take whatever is available and then go from there. And, and then, you know, uh, some of the things we can be uh, looking at, for example, uh, these are not just something I came up with. Um, actually, some of them, the ideas were kind of stolen from, um, you know, uh, uh, some of the uh, the other publications, uh, you know, in particular from Gardner. Okay, so uh, the idea behind it is first of all the risk posture of the the prepackaged images. It's unknown. Okay, a lot of the times. Uh, by the way, is there any idea about how many images are there public images in Do uh, Docker Hub? Any guess? How many? Uh, that's lower. <laughs> it's, uh, it's about uh, 400K from the number I read. That that's uh, as of uh, November of last year, okay? And uh, it's probably increased by, you know, four to five K per week. So it's really growing exponentially, right? The, the thing then is how can you be sure 
whatever you are going to grab, like what I was saying before from the Docker Hub, that it's going to be uh, secure, okay? Uh, it has to start from the base image level, right? So whichever, uh, whichever uh, distro you're looking at, you know, typically maybe uh, Ubuntu or CentOS or maybe uh, CoreOS, whatever. Some of them are actually better. For example, Alpine, I don't know how many people are familiar with it. That's actually a, a pretty minimalistic uh, version and it's pretty good. Okay, uh, then uh, where should the security fit in the process? That's always a challenge. Uh, I, I didn't really talk about my background, but I'm actually uh, more from a DevOps development type of background, personally. And, uh, you know, security is just something I got into maybe within the last eight to 10 years, okay? Starting out with some static analysis type of tools, you know, security scanning, getting into a runtime application protection type of uh, uh, situations. But, you know, uh, as I started getting into that, it's like security is really important. Okay, one of the, the uh, uh, key promises of uh, uh, Docker is the fact that we need to be able to uh, evolve very rapidly as part of our CI CD process, the continuous uh, integration, continuous delivery process. And then at the tail end, how are we going to deal with all those uh, security issues? So that's, that's definitely something we need to uh, cover. And then, um, Containers are not visible with, uh, with current security tools. Okay, this is something hopefully everybody, is there any doubt about that? Any hand? Okay, so essentially what happens is now we have the containers running and the, uh, uh, the containers, they're basically opaque to all the existing tools. You know, when you do a, if you want to look at what, what's running on a machine, you do a PS or something like that, all you see are the processes. You don't know what's going on inside of it, okay? If you try to look at the network traffic, a lot of the times you can see what's between the host to host, but guess what? You don't really know what each container is doing, okay? And uh, we will di uh, dive into that uh, in a lot more details uh, in, uh, in a little bit. But essentially, you have the complications of having different containers, maybe for different applications, all co-located on the same node, the same host. Or potentially, you have containers from machine A talking to machine B, and insofar as you know, the traditional tools, all you are going to see is that machine A is talking to machine B. You have no way of recognizing what's going on, okay? And then um, lastly, uh, a Docker container, basically, it's sitting sitting on top of sort of a virtual OS layer, right? So, you know, this is one of the things everybody talks about. We're trying to uh, virtualize this, the system to really reduce costs and improve efficient, efficient, efficiency and, you know, trying to make uh, things better. Uh, in this case, Docker is great because if you try to spin up a virtual machine, typically it would take, I would say, you know, maybe minutes, you know, potentially, whereas you can actually spin up a Docker image in seconds. Okay, that's kind of the delta we're talking about. It's pretty dramatic. Yet, on the other hand, because of the fact that it's a full OS, now you have a lot of vulnerabilities and risk. You, people can do a lot of things. One of the things uh, 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 when you run Docker is the fact that you have to be able to uh, have either be a, a privileged user or you know you have to be uh, root. So you have to either do sudo or do something to even uh, start a Docker container, okay? So, so once you are able to get into a container, then you have entire world uh, at your disposal. And then for that matter, if you don't really control that, what happens is you can get down to the OS kernel level and then create a lot of damages that way and attack the system. So these are all very real concerns. So, you know, this is kind of a, a picture of me in my younger days and the picture of me right now, okay? <laughs> because I used to be on the dev side, now I'm more on the security side, right? There's going to be a lot of those challenges and, and issues in terms of, hey, uh, uh, part of the, the, the promise of DevOps is we are, we are trying to accelerate delivery of uh, applications, 
Yet, you know, the security guy, on the other hand, as we were saying, I had no visibility into what's going on. What am I going to do? You cannot uh, run this thing in a, in a production environment. Okay, that, that's, that's uh, no if or but. You just have to be able to in, uh, be in compliance with your security policies. And so with that, now we have a, we have a conflict. We have a problem. So here are the, the kinds of things we can be talking about. Uh, people can potentially be exploiting uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, they may be running un unauthorized image, uh, images. So as an example, you know, uh, one of my colleagues likes, uh, likes to say, will you go out and pick up a, US, a USB stick from you know, somewhere and then stick it into your server farm? Okay, it's, it's not going to happen. And uh, on the other hand, you know, that in terms of as a developer, what I do, when I was uh, starting to play with Docker, I just pull an image from Docker Hub, and I'm happy. You know, I, if I need to have additional stacks sitting on top of it, you know, like JBoss or Nginx or whatever, I just pull the right one, and I think, you know, this is going to make my life a lot easier as a developer, but we got problems there, potentially anyway, okay? Privilege escalation, I talked about that before. so. Uh, you don't really want to have anybody, everybody running stuff. So I don't know. Um, uh, in, in a little bit, you know, I'm going to actually do a little bit demo because of the fact that, you know, as people would say, seeing is believing, right? So I'm going to show how, how this can actually work. But for example, if you want to uh, be able to get into a container as root, basically you have the world, you know. So it's, it's very important to, to recognize that. Then from the host uh, resource impact standpoint, there are going to be challenges such as, uh, you know, um, when you are trying to run stuff inside a host machine, you can set quotas. Okay, you can say CPU quota, memory quota, whatever you may be looking at. But when you're inside of the container, who's going to help you to do that? Who's going to control that? And if you are, again, letting the container run wild, you will then end it up with potentially a crash machine. You know, it's going to crash maybe not just the application you're running. You know, it could be crashing multiple applications. And that can be a, you know, from a security standpoint, that can be a denial of service type of attack, right? So, so again, you know, those are the kinds of things uh, very important. And lastly, but not the least, we need to have accountability, okay? Uh, from a security professional standpoint, you always need to have some kind of audit trail in terms of what's going on. Where are you going to get that? Okay. And uh, if, unfortunately, if there is an attack, then, you know, everybody would come back and run some kind of for, uh, forensic and say, what's going on here? You know, who actually attacked us? You know, what happened? You also need that log, that trail of information to help you to First of all, understand what has transpired, and secondly, trying to you know, figure out how you can prevent that uh, the next time. So all of these things, somehow, they have to be uh, uh, managed and controlled. So let's start with the notion of uh, uh, the decision a developer will be making. So I don't know, it's a little bit hard to read in the back, so, uh, but these are all CentOS uh, versions, okay? And this has been scanned by Aquasec, uh, uh, Aquasec uh, server. So essentially, you know, you can see there are different numbers of uh, security issues, 32 high, 2 high, 44. And one of the things kind of interesting is that if you look at all the versions, it's not the latest is always the greatest from a security standpoint. Okay. So as part of that process in terms of just picking what needs to have done, you really need to uh, uh, pay attention to that. In fact, you know, if everything being equal, if you are looking at this list, what shall we do? I, you know, from a security standpoint, will be picking the one with the least number of high vulnerabilities, right? Make sense? Okay, so all, the, all of those are the kinds of things, that's just the initial step. You know, we all love, uh, 
doing development. By the way, I, I'm making certain assumptions. Most people here are developers. Any security folks? Okay, a few. So, <laughs> so hopefully, you know, I, I'm not offending, you know, the security people. And I think, you know, all of those are real concerns people need to be aware of. So uh, let's talk about what the security people want. Okay, safe images. We talked about that. Um, uh, they have to be from trusted sources. Obviously, you know, you don't want to uh, get some uh, uh, some images from I don't know. People talk about Eastern European countries or something like that. Who knows? Whatever. Um, um, and then you know the uh, accountability and all the data uh, of container usage. So again, we need to have a record of whatever transpired inside of the containers. Compliance of the container environment, okay? This is something which may be a, a little bit off topic, but yet on the other hand, it's very important. Uh, most of you are probably familiar. There's a, a something called Docker Bench, okay? It's published by uh, CIS, Center for Inter Internet Security, right? So if at the least what should have been done is that we want to make sure that the host environment where uh, running our containers do meet the recommendations in terms of how the system should be configured. So, you know, that's, that's something very basic, very critical. But yet, on the other hand, you know, if the, the base system is compromised, guess what? You know, the containers are going to have uh, uh, problems as well. Network segmentation, I talked about, you know, interconnect uh, uh, host communication, uh, intra, uh, you know, a host container to con uh, container communications. Especially when you're uh, looking into uh, looking at situations where you have a lot of different containers running, we do need to uh, uh, pay attention to that uh, security practices, and then uh, be, uh, that that's something which I think a lot of the times it's being overlooked is that at the end of the day, every organization has to be really care be careful about what they're doing. So there's going to be an overarching. Uh, security control policies, okay? The policies are going to, uh, uh, you know, dictate in terms of what can or cannot be done. So as an example, um, I have met customers, they, they would say, okay, this is really a, a high vulnerable, uh, uh, an image with high vulnerabilities. However, it's okay, it's okay. Because as part of the security organization's audit, they decided, determined the fact that there are ways they can mitigate things because of the existing practices or some environmental type of conditions to, you know, to allow it to continue to operate while they are trying to figure out what can be done next, right? So it's uh, all those security practices, somebody knows about it, you know, unless it's really just a startup, uh, mom and pop shop, you know, I, I hope, hope again, I'm not offending anybody here. But uh, the reality is that when you start dealing with those kinds of uh, situations, that's when you want to say, we have a set of security policies in place. And how are we going to really leverage that, you know, leverage all the experiences, knowledges, uh, knowledge we have, and then try to apply them again. And the last part is probably the key to this entire talk is that there needs to be communications between the security people and the DevOps teams, okay? Because at the, uh, uh, the other, uh, uh, I guess, uh, picture showing the fact that, you know, there's kind of an antagonistic type of view of the world, it really doesn't have to be that way, right? It really has to be something that's, that's more uh, uh, cooperative, and more uh, symbiotic. So, this is something maybe you're familiar with. You know, this is Docker's tagline, build, ship, run, okay? So that's kind of what made uh, Docker really kind of useful, import, uh, important. But yet on the other hand, you know, uh, we uh, injected a, another uh, step in the, in the middle in terms of your CI CD process is uh, deploy. And we're going to get into each one of them individually. Uh, first of all, we're looking at uh, uh, image in, uh, control in terms of uh, um, visibility, you know, and kind of risk we are, not, uh, we are aware of. Uh, 
then we are going to get into how can we really trust what's going on because even if, it, if an image is good, still, you really need to sort of have some ways of managing that because as a, an organization, you don't really want to run the risk of either having something you don't know about or something you cannot trust to run inside of your environment. User access control, that's pretty standard. That's uh, something everybody has to deal with. And then also uh, the resource utilization. So, you know, this is really kind of what uh, Aqua is trying to promote, which is there's an entire sequence of steps. Okay, this is, we like to use the word platform. Uh, the word platform, sometimes it's overloaded, but really we're looking at how to go uh, uh, provide the protections, uh, the security protection you need from end to end, from you know your build phase to your ship phase to your deployment phase to your run phase. Okay, so we would like to have you know uh, a entire environment which will then be controlled and secured by that. So during the build phase, uh, we talked about making sure base images are secure and. Uh, we need to be able to register trusted image as appropriate for use. We need to be able to uh, scan for vulnerability on the finished product. So all those are something which if you are not doing, I would strongly recommend that you know you take a look at it. And uh, the information has to be shared uh, amongst all the different uh, uh, team members. And this is kind of an interesting slide, okay? Because traditionally, Everybody looks at it as what's above the dash line. There's the public registry, and then there's going to be the private registry. Okay, the public one is the one which Docker makes uh, makes it available. A lot of the times, you may have something that's proprietary, and, and or you don't want to, you know, have have it being available to someone else. You would then, you know, uh, create and establish private registry for them, but now we're talking about taking them a step further. Okay, so this is kind of a funnel. You have a lot of images you are going to feed into your uh, system. Then eventually at the other end, it's only the ones which have passed image policy can be run in your production environment. So for that matter, you know, if I'm just a, de a developer doing work on my laptop, potentially, you know, it, it may be okay to deal with just the top two, right? But yet on the other hand, Anything that goes into production must first pass whatever security policies I was talking about before. And then, you know, then also, you know, being approved, register, and then eventually so we can run them. And then when we get into the ship phase, um, uh, we will only accept known images in the first place. And uh, we are going to approve images based on risk and then we're going to maintain the integrity of it. So at this stage, maybe I can just do a little bit showing instead of talking. Uh, let's see. So here's a browser view of what we know about the system, and we start talking about image assurance. So let's first take a look at, you know, here are potentially from different, in my case, I only have Docker Hub and local hosts as, uh, as the sources, but you can see the fact that I have scanned a number of different images. You know, you have the ability then to look into what's going on, and uh, for instance, uh, in this case, what, what I have is I have two uh, versions inside of the same repository. One's being marked as, uh, you know, uh, being high and, and uh, it's a little bit hard to read maybe, but it says it's disallowed, okay? So that one failed the policy check, okay? And then the next one, it's doing a little bit better. So what actually happens is that I have uh, build the image using some known problem and make sure if it fails <laughs> for demo pur uh, purposes. And then, you know, that's, that's what's going on, okay? And then for each one, of, uh, each one of them, you know, some of the things you may be interested in is what are some of the vulnerabilities? And then you can 
look up the, uh, all the details. So for example, this is a reference to MVD. You know, for uh, most people, you prob probably may be familiar with, you know, this is done by NIST, the National Insti Institute of Standards and Technologies. Okay, so this is one of the sources. Uh, it's probably the most important source of information. Yet on the other hand, there are going to be other sources as well. So for example, if we go back to this guy and look at, oops, some of the stuff here. So you can see that, you know, for example, Red Hat also has a, has a uh, uh, service advisory. Okay, so it's yet another source. So, you know, there are going to be multiple sources of potential vulnerabilities. And uh, ideally what you want to do is being able to cross check to make sure that yes, indeed, we are covering the ones which are significant to us, right? And for that matter, you know, in a way, maybe more the merrier because then, you know, we are going to be sure it's going to be secure. And uh, something else also would be interesting to say, uh, to mention is that we are also, you know, showing how, what's the fixed version. So if you have a bad version, you want to patch it. That's a no brainer, right? So you, you, you want to say, here's my uh, uh, base image. Uh, then the next layer up, then I'm going to patch it. So, you know, I'm going to, uh, to uh, build a new image based on, you know, the information I have there. Okay. And uh, so, you know, this is kind of what you can do. And in terms of a policy standpoint, here are the kinds of things potentially you may be interested in doing. Okay. For example, I talked about, talked about blocking unknown images. Okay. So in a, in a dev environment, that's probably an overkill because it's going to stop me from doing my work. But in a production environment, that's essential. Okay. And then um, you can maybe identify certain vulnerabilities you are not interested in uh, having, you know, at any cost, and you can blacklist them. You can, uh, uh, MVD actually has a scoring system called uh, uh, NCSS. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, they help you to figure out this, uh, the criticality of the, the vulnerabilities. And then you can use that as a way to say, on the average, if my system comes out with a you know, certain uh, threshold, uh, com comes under a certain threshold and I'm happy, then that's fine. Or it, it can say, uh, basically the scale goes from zero to four are you know, uh, minor problems. Uh, four to seven are medium problems, and seven and up is you know high vulnerability. And so you can you know decide what the threshold may be, and that can be your high water mark. Okay, so those are some of the things you can do uh, in terms of setting up the policy. You can whitelist images. Sometimes it may be important to keep certain things running while you are still patching them. So you know that's that's also uh, something you, very useful. And then here's uh, another piece which is important is that we talked about image uh, assurance in terms of you know, checking and, and trying to identify the vulnerabilities. But as we all know, there are new vulnerabilities being uh, reported all the time. So even if they are clean, who's going to go back and rescan them? Who's going to go back and recheck them? Okay. So for example, in this case, what we're talking about is that you may want to uh, institute a uh, a process of running daily scans. So that way, now you have the abilities to say, okay, uh, if there's anything new, I am going to be alerted to that fact. And in fact, in a little bit, I, can talk, I, I will talk about how does that translate into, if you have containers running out there already with those images, how are you going to find out? You know, I don't know if anybody knows of a standard way of knowing here are all the images running and, um, you know, and being able to flag and report that kind of situations. And, you know, those are the kinds of stuff we need to have uh, control over. So, um, 
With that, I am going to actually try something different as well, so you can see what's going on here. Let me make this bigger. More readable, so wow. Hmm. My keyboard it's not letting me type, so I may have to skip it. <laughs> this is actually a new MacBook too, so this is the latest and greatest. That's weird. Yep. Okay. Well, uh, you know, in fact, that's an interesting question. Um, in 2015, there is a, a study by Cluster, IQ, uh, Cluster HQ, and uh, they identified the number one problem, uh, you know, in terms of deploying containers is uh, security. Surprise, surprise, right? So, and they redone the, the study again this year, um, or last year now, 2016, and uh, the number one problem is what? Storage, persistent storage, right? So you know that it's it's definitely something people are aware of. So as an example, I can be talking about um, the fact that um, oh, I think I know maybe what's going on. Uh, let me kill this guy and restart it, and while I'm talking. Um, so persistent storage is definitely an issue uh, we need to be aware of, but from a security standpoint. It's really more like who can access what. So there, there are going to be different ways we'll be talking about. Okay, first of all, are we talking about some kind of amount of volumes in, in, inside of Docker, right? So how can you control access to the, the, the amount of volume? That's something we actually are able to provide to protect you uh, from that kind of situations. And uh, the second part of it is that, you know, a lot of the times, Maybe if you have a database or something, you are going to be going through some kind of network traffic, and then you know you are going to have a, a an IP address, a port number, or something like that you'll be talking to. How can you really control the situation such that it's going to be, hey, you know, these are the known access path. These are you know something I know about, and uh, you know therefore it's okay. However, anything that's out of the ordinary will then be flagged. Okay, so. I think a lot of it really is that how do we manage that kind of situation? So persistent storage, you know, it's going to be manifested into different forms, but yet, you know, fundamentally, ultimately, there are going to be different ways for us to control that. So I think the problem I'm having is my demo machine is running on Azure, and because I didn't touch it for a long time, maybe it timed out, so let's try again. Okay, great. So I can type. How about that? Let me see if I can make it bigger. Okay. So hopefully everybody can uh, read it now. So what I'm going to do is that uh, I talked about I had two images, right? So the first thing I want to do is uh, then show you what happens if we try to run an image which has been disallowed. So I'm just going to run a script as well. Okay, so we're just going to be uh, pulling an image Okay, this is a Docker pull. Everybody's uh, aware of it, familiar with it. We're going to run it. 
So right in the middle of the, the screen, we're saying this is an unauthorized image. Okay, so this is the fact that we have checked this image against the security policies, and then you know we determine the fact that it's not allowed to run. It hasn't been approved. So we're going to stop it right there and then. Okay, and then in this case, um, you know we know two is uh, valid, so we're going to just uh, retag it, and then you know. If we look at Docker images, you know, that I guess it's going to be a Docker image list as we just learned uh, uh, 10 minutes or half an hour ago, whatever. If you look at it, basically, if you look at 1.0 and 2.0, they're identical, right? So we retagged it, and uh, supposedly, if you are not able to uh, check further, you may be happy. Voila, it's still disapproved. Okay, and if you look at what Aqua knows about it, uh, let me make this screen bigger. It says there's an invalid digest. Okay, so we are, before remember I was talking about that dash line above and below, okay? Now we are talking about Inside of Aqua, we are providing additional control such that we know exactly what that image should be. So you cannot just try to run a rogue image with you know, potentially uh, the same inf uh, tag inf information you know, just by merely modifying it, then you, ex you can expect it to run. The answer is no, we know more about that. So let's see what actually happens. If I pull the real demo 2.0 and then I try to run it, you know, in this case, it's very simplistic. All I'm trying to do is uh, say hello world and work. Okay, so this is a very, very simple demonstration of what you need to control in a production environment. Whereas, you know, if you have something which violated your policies, you are going to, you know, totally, totally say this is not going to happen. But then, you know, if you had the valid one, then it's going to work just fine. And for that matter, if you say, Mr. Aqua, what do you know about me? Now it says it's register. Okay, so the magic there, obviously something, you know, nothing is magical, right? So what happens is the fact that we have this uh, server digest in the middle of the page. And if you go back to our um, images, let's maximize this guy again. When we do the scanning, it's important to realize that we're scanning on a per package basis, based on the version. We're going to try to uh, make, uh, do the matching to see if there are vulnerabilities. And then, if we look into the meta data section, there's a digest value. And that's the magic cookie. Okay, that's how you can control that. And this is, you know, obviously you can come up with different uh, implementations, but uh, this is how we do it. So we would actually compute the, um, this is a SHA-256 value if anybody is familiar you know, with the algorithm. But anyway, the point being that uh, we'll, we will compute based on the individual packages and roll them up into a total value. So it's highly, highly, highly unlikely that you are going to come up with the same value. So you will never be able to run a rogue image. Okay, so now so far what we're talking about really is just statically you know, I have an image, I'm going to scan for vulnerabilities, then at some stage, I'm going to then, you know, uh, try to run it and try to prevent it from running if it's disapproved. But then, you know, there's going to be a lot more in terms of uh, what people should be uh, working with. So now we're getting into the uh, latter phase of uh, deploying and running, okay, so. So we kind of talked about, we have the image policies, we're going to do the uh, registration, so we know about it, and then we can prevent it from happening. Okay, so that's uh, what I just went through. So as an interlude, uh, I'm going just to uh, just play a video. Somebody move! Do something! 
Oh, I'm not a security guard. I'm a security monitor. I only notify people if there's a robbery. There's a robbery. Okay, so I cannot take credit for that. It's actually from uh, LifeLock, one of their commercials. It's an identity theft you know, company. But anyway, the point is that we don't really just want to monitor and understand what's going on. We want to stop uh, bad behaviors from happening in the first place, right? So this is really getting into sort of moving from the static world into the dynamic world, okay? How can you really do that? And um, so essentially what we want to do is uh, we want to make sure only the right people can do it and only the uh, 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 right persons with the, the correct level of uh, access privilege can do certain work and there cannot be uh, elevation, escalation of privilege. And then uh, permissions on, you know, back to the gentleman in the back. How are we going to control any kind of accessing to the volumes being mounted? Any kind of ne network related type of issues? And lastly, having the ability to uh, track what's going on. Okay. So we talked about members of Docker group can do anything, right? So essentially, this is what's going to happen. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I'm going to run all the uh, demo steps, but for example, if you are not part of the right group, you know, potentially if you're part of Docker group, you may be able to, uh, you know, just stop a container, okay? In a production environment, that can be disastrous. So we don't want to have that kind of things happening to us. And uh, we don't want to have people infiltrate into your containers and then through privilege escalation and going down, and maybe I would demo that part in a little bit. But then, you know, so, and then in the runtime, you want to be able to uh, make sure the, you know, the context of the user trying to run it, the resource uh, being used, leverage, leverage all the executable and uh, any kind of things happening inside of the containers, uh, the behaviors are going to be known, okay? So what's the magic trick there? And uh, the way Aqua uh, uh, does it is that we're going to create profiles, okay? So it's almost like if you apply for a credit card and then you start using it and you go out and people say, here's the sp uh, spending pa uh, pattern, right? So they are going to monitor and control. There are going to be expected behaviors, something that you, you know that it's, it's normal, it's regular. Anything which goes beyond that, for example, if there's a charge of you know, my credit card in, let's say, China, and I, I wasn't visiting China, guess what? You know, it's probably gonna be bad, and I don't want to have that happen to me, and I'm sure nobody wants to have that happen to you either, right? So this is the, the notion of a profile in terms of what you can do using uh, the, the Aqua capabilities. And the other piece kind of interesting is who is going to help you to uh, define that set of uh, uh, profiles? Are, you, are we going to do it by hand, manually? Chances are no, because it's going to be too complex. It, chances are, you know, you won't get it right, <laughs> unfortunately. So what we do is we actually will monitor the, you know, the runs you are making inside of the containers. You know, it could be testing, could be staging, could be production, you know, any one of those. And we are going to see what, what's happening inside of the container. We're going to collect that information. We're going to generate a profile. And then you can, you know, enforce that profile. So at the runtime, if anything abnormal, uh, uh, you know, unusual happen, then you know you have a actually you still have a choice. You can either say, "Nah, this is not going to happen." You know, I'm going to stop it, or you can say, uh, "Well, I'm just going to trigger a security alert, so you know our security team can start you know digging into it and see what's going on." Right? So. It, that kind of decision, again, is going to be policy-based, based on you know, what you know about. Yet on the other hand, it's not me, is it? <laughs> um, so um, anyway, uh, so we have the auto-profiling capabilities. And uh, let me show you a bit of 
what are some of the details? So again, we go to this uh, notional image. And for each one of them, you can apply a, a, a profile. And uh, so you have the ability to say, are network traffic allowed? OK, either inbound, outbound. If you have something which you would never expect it to go out, you can, uh, you can control that. And this is actually at the more coarse level. We also have a finer granularity of control in terms of if you were to model things uh, uh, as applications or uh, services, then we have the ability to further clamp it down based on your IP address, based on the subnet, uh, subnet mask, and then based on uh, uh, you know whatever it should be allow or disallow, and even down to the poor level. Okay, so so there's uh, going to be a lot of uh, finer gran granularity of control, and then we talked about you know uh, controlling what can be run inside of the container. This is basically a list of the processes. We talked about the fact that we have a full operating system. And you know, for example, one of the things you're not seeing here is like, uh, you know, like yum or apt-get or something like that, right? You don't want to have somebody who somehow has the ability to go in and start installing different packages. And uh, um, in a minute, I can show you something as simple as right now, do we have a LS on this list? No, we don't, right? So you can't even figure out what, exactly what's inside of it, okay? If you want to run a cat, if you want to run a ping, if you want to run any one of those things, no way, okay? So these are considered as a way of white listing, okay? Earlier on, we talked about blacklist, and uh, those are the ones you don't want to have happen. And then you can actually come up with a white list of all the possible uh, steps and actions, and from there, only these guys are allowed. Everything else is disallowed, okay? Uh, we talked about uh, identity inside of the container. You can control you know, who can do what. In this case, uh, in a production environment, I have set up a, a, an ID 1000 that's going to be part of the automation. Only automated you know, deployment and, and running is allowed, and we can do that. And uh, we also have... Uh, other pieces, and one of them is we can also help you to encrypt the secrets, okay? One of the things in uh, 113 coming out is that uh, secrets management. We actually also have, have a component to help you. Uh, first of all, we can work with uh, secret management products of, like uh, Vault from HashiCorp. I don't know, anybody ever run into that? Okay, maybe a couple. And so that way, you know, the secrets will never get actually touched. We will treat them almost as an environment variable. And then eventually, when it gets into a container, we can also uh, uh, encrypt it. So, you know, if you are trying to uh, get, a, uh, get the value out of it, you, you cannot because of, uh, you know, all the, even the keys in terms of how we uh, encrypt it and decrypt it, it's on a per, um, instance basis, so they are basically a, a ephemeral type of uh, keys. You will never see them again, okay? Uh, so let's go ahead and look at what else can we be talking about. So I kind of covered this, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but one of the things really interesting is that actually with containers, the security should be stronger than you know, regular applications because of the fact that they're all microservices. What are they supposed to do? Only do one set of limited capabilities, uh, uh, you know, and uh, they should be able to do them well in a cohesive form. So now you have the ability to monitor all the behaviors inside of it and make, uh, make it possible to manage and control that. Uh, so we kind of talked about uh, 
control in terms of you know what's going on. I'm not going to do the demo now, just in the interest of time. So for example, if you try to execute uh, an app that's running, just running Bash, guess what? Normally it's going to be okay, but uh, really you don't. If you are trying to prevent uh, privilege escalation, it's going to be denied. Okay, it's only when you are trying to run it as a regular user, then you know, or, or the user who started it, then because I am the owner, I have control over it. So I, you know, if I were to uh, just uh, try to get in the, into the shell uh, window, use a dash IT flag, then I can do something. And then, you know, the rest of it, just showing that, you know, the com commands are not going to be uh, available and uh, allowable. I can do the demo for you, maybe afterwards, if you're interested in. And then from the network standpoint, this is exactly what we're talking about. Traditionally, what happens is the fact that, you know, Everybody will stand up hosts or virtual machines and try to do some kind of perimeter defense. Okay, trying to uh, uh, set up firewalls to make sure you know uh, only uh, known traffic is going to come through, uh, and you cannot either get out or have incoming traffic in terms of what's going on uh, inside of the, the that kind of environment. But when you are in a containerized type of uh, environment, that's no longer applicable. As we were talking about, inside of the same machine, you may have different containers running, or you know you may have the the containers being instantiated, uh, started, activated, you know across uh, a lot of different environments. Specifically, you know a lot of our customers are now getting into either a public cloud or a private uh, cloud type of situation. You don't really have control over that anymore. So again, the traditional tools are going to be problematic from that standpoint. They don't, they don't know what's going on, and they don't understand it. And you know, so we are going to provide you information to control that visibility. This is the other part. Um, first of all, any kind of uh, information coming through, any kind of security events from the Docker, we are going to log them. Okay, so that's really what that's trying to show, and then. Also, you know, when you have uh, different um, applications, different containers running, we have the ability to tell you, you know, whether those images are even registering in the first place. You know, if they, it's no, in this case, actually what happened uh, uh, was because of the fact that maybe it's a dev machine or something like that. You don't really care about it as much. We're not going to prevent you from, you know, running them. Yet on the other hand, this is where you can get the visibility. And then, as I was saying before, this is where if you do daily rescanning, then you are going to see here are the, uh, 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 the ones which are running, and then you know uh, whether they are really um, uh, new, newly uncovered vulnerability causing certain images to be not in compliance, in non-compliance uh, state, and we can get you all of that kind of information. So this, this is kind of the end of my uh, presentation today. Uh, Docker actually offers a better security opportunity. Okay. However, it's not going to be free. <laughs> and that's what we're talking about here. So uh, every single bullet I'm, uh, uh, you know, on, the, uh, on the screen, we basically talked about it, preventing unknown images. Stop images by CVE if if that's you know how you want to handle it. Uh, privilege escalation, you know the, the the key notion in any kind of security environment is uh, uh, people ought to apply this notion called these privilege principle. Okay, and you know typically in a traditional environment you may have some kind of uh, RBAC or something to limit control and access. But when you get into the container based type of uh, situations. How are we going to do that? That you know, that's important to be aware of. Stop suspicious process. You know, I this is a Mac. I used to be a Windows guy. Okay, <laughs> so sometimes I'll just go into Task Manager and see, 